Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. There are almost 400 people registered for this webinar, so we're going to give everyone a few minutes to log on and to start our live stream to Facebook. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started and hopefully we will be on Facebook soon. Good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Colleen Cipriani and I'm the Assistant Dean for Inclusive Excellence at the Gilling School of Global Public Health, an Associate Professor in our Public Health Leadership Program. I want to begin first by acknowledging that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is built on land previously inhabited by the Okanichi band of the Saponi Nation. North Carolina is home to eight indigenous nations and has the largest indigenous population east of the Mississippi River. We acknowledge and give thanks to the first peoples of this land and their descendants. We look forward to building upon the honored memories and goodwill of all who walked and labored here before us. On behalf of everyone at the Gilling School of Global Public Health, located on the beautiful Chapel Hill campus of the University of North Carolina, I want to welcome you all to the second webinar in our new Inclusive Excellence series entitled Emergency Preparedness, Ethics, and Equity. The topic for today's webinar is pandemic protection for people who are incarcerated. And our moderator is Dr. Dana Rice, Assistant Professor in the Public Health Leadership Program at the Gilling School of Global Public Health. Dana will get us started with some opening remarks and we'll then introduce our panelists. Dana? Thanks, Colleen. I'm um, really honored to be part of this important conversation today. I wanna thank the Inclusive Excellence team for your courageous leadership on this topic. As you know, I spent more than 15 years working in jails in Detroit, Michigan, so this is a topic that I really care about. Um, as Colleen said, I, my name is Dana Rice and I'm an assistant professor uh, in public health leadership at the Gilling School of Global Public Health. Today's webinar, Pandemic Protection for People Who Are Incarcerated, will look at the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 is having on people in jails, prisons, and detention centers, and how it's affecting underrepresented minority and marginalized communities. We'll discuss what we can do to prevent or mitigate the damage being done to combat these disturbing statistics. And finally, consider what we can learn from our actions that can be sustained to advance reforms in the criminal legal system, to provide equitable care for all and address the harms caused by mass incarceration. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to set the frame for today's conversation and provide some context on what we're facing right now with regard to the impact of this pandemic on people who live and work behind bars. I'll start with a note on the importance of language. Our language informs our opinions, our policies, and our actions. We must all commit to avoid the use of stigmatizing language like inmate, prisoner, or felon in favor of terms they humanize like people who are incarcerated or individuals in detention. Second, throughout this conversation, you may hear several of us refer to the term criminal legal system instead of criminal justice system, and this is intentional given that it's questionable at best if the system as designed was meant to deliver justice. It's also important to understand that there's a fundamental difference between jails and prisons. So jails are facilities which house individuals waiting for trial or serving short sentences and are typically managed at the local level by counties 
um, or city governments. Whereas prisons house people who've been convicted of a crime and these facilities are managed by states and the federal government. So this nuance is important to note, especially when considering who's responsible and accountable for implementing prevention and mitigation measures. There are currently more than 2.2 million people detained in correctional facilities in the United States. Preventing and mitigating the spread of COVID-19 among people who are detained in correctional institutions is a public health crisis within a public health crisis. The conditions of confinement, which include overcrowding, limited access to health care, an inability to implement adequate social distancing, large-scale medical isolation or quarantine, and a lack of access to consistent cleaning and sanitizing supplies makes managing COVID-19 next to impossible. Couple that with a population that has higher rates of chronic conditions and other comorbidities, and that includes a substantial number of people who are over 55 years old, and you have the potential for catastrophic outcomes for people that live and work in these institutions, and ultimately the wider community. To date, the rates of COVID-19 in correctional institutions that we know of are far outpacing community rates of infection from Rikers Island Jail in New York, to the Cook County Jail in Chicago, to the prisons in Ohio. All over this country, this pandemic is showing us that people living and working in prisons, jails, and detention centers are uniquely vulnerable in this moment of a public health emergency. And due to the policies that have created and sustained our system of mass incarceration, these outbreaks and resulting complications are also having disparate impacts on people of color as they make up the vast majority of the people who are incarcerated. As of today, state officials from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services are currently working to help manage more than 1,000 positive cases and nine deaths associated with correctional facilities in North Carolina. And that's recognizing that most jails and prisons have yet to implement widespread testing. So this is most likely represents an undercount of the true number of cases. So today, we want to focus much of this conversation on understanding the impact of the pandemic on the people detained in correctional facilities as a public health, social justice, and human rights issue, and identify equitable, just, and sustainable solutions. So with that, let me introduce our speakers. And I'm not going to go through their full bios. You can find out more about them on our website. But with that, Speaking first is Dr. Lauren Brinkley Rubenstein, an assistant professor of social medicine at the UNC School of Medicine. She'll be followed by Bernadette Brown, founder and president of B. Brown Consulting. And closing the presentations is Amber Akemi Pyatt, director of the Health Instead of Punishment program at Human Impact Partners. Dr. Brinkley Rubenstein. Thank you, Dana, and thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to start the um, start us off really framing why we should use this moment to um, continue progressive criminal legal system reform um, uh, you know advocates have been calling for it advocates have long known that this is overdue and we have seen some reforms implemented um, as a result of COVID-19 but this is an open door that we ought to walk through um, and continue to sustain. And thank you, Dana, for that note on language. And you'll see that I used criminal justice on my slides. And so um, thanks for calling that out. Um, so before I get started, I really wanted to um, uh, talk about this image here that's on my first slide. Um, some colleagues and I have started the COVID Prison Project, which is tracking data across the country on um, rates of COVID inside of prisons in particular. And this is a graphic that was created for us that's based on the concept of viral injustice. And I think that's a perfect way to really frame this discussion and frame what's been happening behind bars. Um, next slide, please. So um, Dana gave a little bit of an overview around the criminal legal system in the US. And I thought um, for those of us who may be less familiar with it, that this might be a nice um, graphic um, to talk about. And so um, there's a big difference between jails and prisons. And there's a big difference in the implications in some ways around um, what's happening in COVID-19. And so um, there are about 2.3 million people who are confined in state and federal prisons and local jails and about 10 million people cycle through our jail system in any given year. There are about 4 million people total who are in the criminal legal system, and um, those other 2 million people are people who are on probation, post-release supervision, or parole. And so giant numbers of people who are impacted by the criminal justice system um, uh, and also um, impacted by COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. 
So I think it's really important to frame incarceration as a socio-structural determinant of health, and it has been and it continues to be in our current crisis. Mass incarceration in the United States is a civil rights, a human rights, and a public health crisis that is the result of social, political, and economic forces rooted in enduring leg legacies of slavery and oppression along the lines of race and class. Mass incarceration is the result of social, political, and economic forces with deep roots in the aftermaths of slavery, labor exploitation, and racial discrimination. This is evident in the stark racial inequalities that exist in the carceral system. Black people are more likely to be arrested, killed by police, incarcerated, and placed in solitary confinement than their white counterparts. The criminalization of blackness and poverty as reflected in the failed war on drugs, draconian sentencing laws, centralized power of prosecutors, a school to prison pipeline, and gutting of health and social systems is among the forces underlying the titanic expansion and deep entrenchment of the carceral state. Over the past 40 years, our society has deliberately divested from social and public goods designed to promote health and economic security while pumping resources into police, courts, and correctional systems that punish, impoverish, and dehumanize people and communities. As such, we have to be explicit in saying that incarceration is a socio-structural determinant of health that targets people of color and exacerbates racial health disparities. In the context of COVID-19, prisons and jails have not been the focus of proactive intervention, and this inaction will only further exacerbate these disparities. Next slide, please. Prisons and jails are amplifiers of infectious diseases because of overcrowding and unsanitary living conditions and, living, and will most certainly contribute to these um, estimates of COVID-19 that we're seeing explode day over day um, in correctional facilities. As Dana mentioned, COVID-19 outbreaks have already been identified in many jails and prisons ac across the country, and they really have been the epicenter of the epicenter. Um, eight of the 10 largest um, outbreaks in the country are in correctional settings. Um, in response, some correctional systems have implemented changes to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, and that includes reducing jail and prison admissions and releasing people from facilities. And then in tandem, jails and prisons really also have to initiate facility level policies that help stead spread, stop the spread of COVID-19. But these types of um, initiatives behind the bars are really difficult for a number of reasons. And I think um, a number of panelists are gonna talk about the conditions of confinement, but um, it's virtually impossible to um, engage in social distancing inside of correctional facilities. Most of these facilities are congregate living facilities meaning that people sleep in dormitory style um, living arrangements, they recreate together, they, um, they eat together, um, and they're often at baseline overcrowded. And so um, very difficult to enact um, social distancing policies inside of these facilities. And the other reason why um, people who are incarcerated are at such risk is really because um, they often have a higher burden of illness and disease than their non-incarcerated counterparts. People who are incarcerated on average have one chronic health condition. Um, and we also have an aging population. So about 11% of people who are incarcerated are over 55. And the people who are older are much more likely to experience COVID-19 severely. Next slide, please. So I really just want to talk about um, how public safety is not in tension with public health. I think that um, it's clear that prisons and jails are public safety institutions in which public health is an afterthought, but public health should not be in, in, um, in, in contrast to public safety. In fact, engaging in public health efforts are public safety acts. And so I think we have to think about those in the same vein. So some states have moved to um, some progressive reform, and we've seen that before COVID-19. We've seen um, progressive DAs be elected to embrace cash bail reform, um, and we've seen it in the context of COVID-19 too. We've seen jails in particular um, have uh, evaluate the people who are inside of their facilities to um, release people who have not been sentenced to are pre-trial and also to take a, a look at the people inside and see who are serving low-level sentences and prioritize those folks for release. Pr prisons have done a much worse job of this. In some ways they have 
constraints such as parole boards, but they also um, have been less open to the idea of release. Um, but this is an open door that we ought to walk through and should be sustained and is something that should have happened far longer ago. Um, um, I think an important thing to mention here too is, you know, when we have these um, initiatives in which people are released, we, it, reform cannot stop there. We cannot let people out and then not worry about what happens next. And so we've seen this when um, we've let some folks out and there's been no consideration to the things that might be needed in the community. Um, One minute, Lauren. Thank you. Um, time flies much quicker than it uh, in real life than in your brain. But um, so I just want to say that there are some really important programs that have thought hard about this. And there are some states and cities that have provided housing for people who might not have it otherwise um, in the form of hotel rooms or other um, arrangements. And so I think really just making um, a, a explicit um, saying that there's an explicit need for post-release consideration is a really big part of this puzzle. Okay, and now last slide. Um, so in conclusion, more widely adopting these types of uh, reforms in the short term will improve our ability to weather the spread of COVID-19 through the United States. However, to truly tackle our current system of injustice, these changes should be accompanied by broader policy efforts aimed at decarceration using a prison abolitionist ethic. Mass incarceration is a public health emergency. We can address this emergency by reducing the number of people who are sentenced to correctional supervision, whether in the community or in confinement, and increasing investments in the root causes of crime, expanding education and economic opportunities, et cetera. The need for radical criminal justice reform is long overdue. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Bernadette? Great, hey, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Bernadette, and the reason I want to talk about conditions of confinement and why I focus on it so much is because while we want to keep people out of the system and get people who are incarcerated out of those facilities, it is very important that we focus on humane treatment for the people who are there. And in addition to that, you can go to the next slide, Christina. Uh, in addition to that, officer safety is a very important part of keeping facilities safe. So when officers have the appropriate resources they need, they are able, much better able to meet their professional requirements. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about healthcare. So the criminal, shall I say, legal system um, costs about $182 billion a year. About $12 billion of that is spent on healthcare. And accessing timely healthcare is difficult, um, if not impossible, for a lot of people who are in detention, who have an, a, the range of conditions I have listed here on the slide. So when there is a pandemic, it becomes even more difficult to one, get those underlying conditions treated and to deal with the risk factors for COVID. And in addition, when officers become ill, it becomes very difficult for facilities to meet their goals of safety, security, and supervision. So it's very important when we talk about the underlying conditions as well as the pandemic itself. Next. There are groups of people who are even at greater risk of, of various conditions and, and factors. And this is what we call intersecting identities. If you are a member of a marginalized group or multiple marginalized groups, such as a few that are listed here, and this is not by any means an exhaustive list, of course, your risk for healthcare issues and mental health issues are even greater. Next. So there are two issues that I don't think are being addressed or receiving as much attention as I think they should that I want to talk about today. And one is pregnancy and birth and the other is sexual victimization. Next. I want to talk about Andrea Circle Bear. Maybe some of you have heard of her. She's an indigenous woman who on March 20th was uh, transferred from jail in South Dakota to a BOP prison in Texas. And then on the 28th, she was admitted to the hospital with concerns about her pregnancy and released the same day. And on the 31st, she went back to the hospital because she developed symptoms, was admitted and placed on a ventilator. And on the 1st, a C-section was performed. On the 4th of April, her coronavirus test came back positive. And on April 28th, she died. Next. So what happened here? 
well, we're not really, we don't have all the facts right now. This, this is making its way through the news, but we do know one thing, and this is that second bullet point. In the general population, so for people who are not incarcerated, women of color in particular, Black, Native American, and Alaskan Native women have a maternal mortality rate that is three times that of white women. So Ms. Circle Bear was already at risk prior to entering any facility. Obviously, jails and prisons are not considered to be optimal places to be pregnant or to give birth. So, of course, her risk increased after she was there. And a survey that done by the Prison Policy Initiative of all 50 states and the Federal Bureau of Prisons uncovered that 22 states and the BOP did not provide guidelines on caring for people with high-risk pregnancies. Next. But some encouraging news came out earlier this year. One, for the last few years, um, there have been a number of prison doula programs that have popped up. So for those of you who don't know what a doula is, it's a professional who is trained to provide support to childbearing families, both during the prenatal period, during labor and birth, and during the postpartum period. And there are decades of research at this point supporting the use of doulas for women who are not, or pregnant people who are not incarcerated and their efficacy for both the health of the person giving birth as well as the babies. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about the Minnesota Prison Doula Program. Uh, they instituted a program, there's research that was conducted to show that indeed people who are incarcerated who give birth with a doula did in fact have better outcomes for both the person giving birth as well as for the baby as compared to other people who were incarcerated. But what's fascinating about this in January of this year, they released a study that asked the corrections officers in the program their views of the program. And as you can see in these six categories, the majority of corrections officers had very favorable views of the doula program, including saying that a lot of their job duties were actually improved by having the doula there. So this is great. This is the, probably the first study of its kind to be released in January. So this is very encouraging news for uh, people who are giving birth in prisons. Next. Now we're gonna uh, switch to some very depressing uh, statistics about sexual victimization. These in front of you are the approximate rates of victimization in jails, prisons, and juvenile facilities. And what I want to point out here on this slide is, as you can see, the rate in juvenile facilities is a lot higher than in jails and prisons. Next. I want to talk a little bit about uh, sexual victimization in juvenile facilities, and I want to talk about some of those intersecting identities. So if we talk about straight or heterosexual youth as compared to lesbian, gay, bisexual youth, as you can see here, the sexual victim vi victimization rates by staff are almost the same, but look at the huge difference. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual young people are more likely to be sexually abused by other youth than are straight youth. Next. And when we look at jails and prisons, and I'm using inmates here because that's the, the term the researchers use. When we look at jails and prisons, as you can see, something similar happens. Uh, all across the board, lesbian, gay, bisexual adults, or people who don't identify as heterosexual, have much higher rates of sexual victimization as compared to straight people. And speaking of another intersecting identity, when we look at LGB folks, who also have a mental illness, those rates also increase dramatically. Next. And here are the rates for transgender people. And this is pretty extraordinary. As you can see, these rates are extremely, extremely high uh, across the board for victimization by both other people who are incarcerated as well as by facility staff. Next. So a document was released uh, recently by Professor Michelle Deitch uh, recommended strategies for sheriffs and jails to respond to the crisis. I would encourage everybody, especially people on the webinar who work in facilities to take a look at this document. It has a number of suggestions, but with respect to sexual abuse um, in general, you can see here they said prolonged cell confinement and tension could contribute to increased levels of these problems. So this is very important to pay attention to. Lauren mentioned how it's difficult. You can't really socially distance yourself in jails and prisons. So I encourage everybody to take a look at this document so that you can read about some strategies that you can possibly employ in your facility. Next. 
So how are we how are we dealing with this sexual abuse and sexual harassment in facilities? The Prison Rape Elimination Act, otherwise known as PREA, which was passed in 2003, is basically the central federal law that is trying to address this problem. In 2012, the PREA standards were released and the standards are designed to guide facilities on the implementation and enforcement of the law. The National PREA Resource Center is basically the organization's central uh, technical uh, assistance and training organization. They, they provide resources to facilities throughout the country to help them with uh, the implementation. And what's important to note is that these services are free. I'm going to say this again. <laughs> these services are at no cost to the agencies. So this is the place that you really want to go to if you need services at your facility, if you need training, any, any kind of technical assistance. Just Detention International is another great national organization, international organization, also working to decrease sexual victimization in the facilities. Next. So what can you do? If you are in the medical, mental, or public health field, and this includes both professionals as well as students, I, I encourage you to contact youth and correctional facilities uh, and ask them what assistance they need. Do they need teletherapy sessions or online support groups, doula programs, rape crisis, rape crisis center support? These things are very important. And once the quarantine is lifted, or you know, I know a lot of mental health therapists may not be considered essential, but especially when we're talking about, for example, people with gender dysphoria, people who are transgender, what can you do to support trans people who are incarcerated? Uh, what can you do to help with diagnoses, especially in facilities in rural areas? A lot of the time they talk about how they don't have access to healthcare providers who can um, provide services to trans people in particular. So how can you help out with that? If you are in law policy or journalism, support parole efforts and clemency applications. For example, you can contact public defender offices and ask what assistance is needed. As we know, most places, public defenders are overwhelmed and overworked. I'm a former public defender from New York City myself, so I understand what that is. But there's an amazing amount of work that you can do to support attorneys who are working on parole and clemency applications. The other thing a lot of people don't think about is find out if there's a civilian oversight office in your area that provides oversight for correctional facilities and oftentimes uh, police departments as well and talk to them about compliance measures and what are they doing to ensure humane conditions and one of that are they complying with PREA what about the CARES Act you know there are specific provisions of the CARES Act that relates to parole and early release so our facilities our agencies actually complying with that next one minute Bernadette great thank you for-profit corporations, now a lot of people don't think about what for-profit corporations can do. And one of the things is just to think about what your social responsibility platform is. So for those of you who work for businesses, think about what they can do. One is to financially assist facilities and or their contractors with medical and mental health care, uh, support equitable increases in salaries, for officers and as well as funding training and educational programs for officers and develop a fund to cover costs incurred by families of those who are incarcerated. In particular, visitation costs and commissary items. Uh, so a lot of what, how we protect the mental health of people who are incarcerated is to ensure they stay connected to their loved ones in the community. So when we talked about that $182 billion about 1.3 billion dollars goes to phone calls alone. Families are paying about 1.3 billion dollars for phone calls. Uh, families are paying about 1.6 billion dollars for commissary items. And most of that burden falls to cisgender women in the community to fund all of this and they're already of limited financial means. So these are some of the things that you can do to help out with people who are incarcerated. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bernadette. And I want to just take this time to let you all know that the question and answer box is open and available and following Amber's presentation, we'll open up the floor to you all to ask questions. So please feel free to use the Q&A box. We are monitoring that. So Amber. Yeah, thank you. So 
So first, I just want to say thank you to the UNC Gillings School of Public Health for hosting this space, and in particular to Angelica, Chrisanna, Corey, Dana, Colleen, and all the many other people behind the scenes who are helping to create and manage this online space. So my name is Amber Akemi Pyatt. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I serve as the director of the Health Instead of Punishment program at Human Impact Partners, or HIP. Next slide, please. We are a national nonprofit organization that brings the power of public health to movements for a just society. And we do that by conducting policy-driven research and advocacy with community organizers, by organizing individual public health workers, and by providing capacity building services to governmental public health. So I'm coming to you today from unceded Ohlone land in Oakland, California, and I do just want to wish you all health and safety wherever you may be. I know we have people from all over the country and actually all over the world on the call. So our health instead of punishment program is where all of our work around the criminal legal system, including immigration enforcement, lives. And through our partnerships, we really seek to advance health equity, racial justice, and community safety by creating a society where all people are healthy and free. So we work to see that our collective resources are used to help, not to punish or hurt. We are trying to build up the infrastructure where people can get the care and assistance they need to repair any harms they may have caused, to heal historical or ongoing pain, and to grow in community together. We are ultimately working toward a world where there is no need for prisons, jails, detention centers, or policing so that all people can thrive. And we obviously have a long way to go until that vision is a reality and we're taking action along the way to move toward there. So I wanna thank my fellow panelists, Bernadette and Lauren for giving so much context on incarceration in the United States. You know, this COVID-19 pandemic has really laid bare some important truths. Those include, but are not limited to, that incarceration has always been a public health crisis that the health of each of us is dependent on the health of all of us, and that the criminal legal system fundamentally upholds structural oppression, particularly structural racism, which results in the overrepresentation of black and brown people in both our carceral facilities and in the deaths from COVID-19. And that's really heavy, and I don't wanna just breeze past it, so I'm gonna take a moment myself to release the clenching I'm noticing in my body, to breathe, and I invite you to do the same. This is really hard, and I want us to recognize our own humanity in this work too. So I know many of us have been doing work in decarceration, which is just a fancy word for releasing people, releasing people from jails, prisons, and ICE detention centers, and connecting those folks and their families with any community-based resources they may need in the free world. For you know, many years, if, if not decades, we've been doing this work, and the context for our collective work looks very different right now with the clear and present threat of death within and beyond carceral facilities if we do not significantly reduce the population inside. I wanna lift up the recent epidemiological modeling from the ACLU and a team of researchers uh, that shows that current national projections for the death toll due to COVID-19 are faulty because they do not account for how unique the US incarceration system is. And those flaws mean the national death toll is expected to double from the current projection of 100,000 to 200,000 if we do not rapidly decarcerate our jails. So it's really important that we center the voices of folks who are directly impacted by issues and I wanna quickly uplift some testimony from our comrade Eric Wayne, who is currently incarcerated in Santa Rita Jail here in Alameda County, California, to illustrate the reality that folks are facing inside. So he shared that, quote, 
the coronavirus is spreading dramatically fast up in this jail facility. I can't believe that these people are submitting false information to the public. The people housed up in here know the truth of what's really going on, but we get retaliated against by the sheriff. And that's Sheriff Gregory Ahern here in the county. So I know you all are all across the country and the world. I think we have a lot of folks from North Carolina, Virginia, Michigan, California. We also have folks in Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Haiti, India, Kenya. Um, but in the US, pretty much all the local and state incarceration contexts share some common issues. This is rooted in the fact that jails, prisons, and ICE detention centers are built for control and punishment, not for care. They have never been safe or healthy places for our beloved community members, which is why the HIP team focuses our energy around stripping power and resources from the criminal legal system and bolstering community-led and community-owned resources to address issues our communities face that are frankly largely social, political, or economic in nature. And, you know, given public health's focus on prevention, community level intervention, and the social determinants of health, I actually think this sort of transformative work is exactly where we can best leverage our expertise and analyses for good. So with the remaining time I have today, I want to walk us through some of what I'm seeing as the main ways that public health professionals, scholars, students, researchers, advocates, workers, and organizations and institutions are already taking action in partnership with social movement leaders to protect the health and safety of folks who are incarcerated by fighting for their liberation. So real quick, we would love to do a poll just to get a sense of whether folks are already involved in campaigns for decarceration. The experts are certainly not just the people whose videos you can see. I know there's a lot of expertise and wisdom on here. So if folks could quickly answer this. The question, I know the people on the phone won't be able to see this, but the question is, are you currently plugged into decarceration campaigns? The options um, that we have available for you are yes, and you know, but maybe you wanna get more deeply involved. Uh, no, but I'm eager to be involved, or really I'm just here to learn for now. So we'll give you a couple more seconds to do, to respond. And let's try closing it and see what we've got from this small sampling. Cool. Okay, so a good mix. A lot of folks who are here to learn, and I hope that you have learned a lot already. And we can see if we can bump you into the curiosity to get more involved um, with the remaining time. So, um, and thank you to those who are already involved in campaigns. So first, uh, next slide. I'd love to start us with some important ethos for entering into this work. And that includes that one, we should be building upon existing community organizing and movement infrastructure. You should assume that even if you're not involved in it, there is organizing and movement work happening in the place that you are. Second is we need to be centering those who are impacted. They can speak for themselves and let's make sure we are using our platforms to uplift their testimony and lived wisdom. Next is to invest in relationship. The work moves at the speed of trust. This is something I've learned from Adrienne Marie Brown and many movement leaders, and it's so critical that we are building relationships. Another is to walk with humility. That I think needs no explanation. And finally, to share appreciations and celebrate each other early and often. This work is really hard. There's a lot of invisible labor, especially gendered labor. And so we need to make sure that we are sharing appreciations and uplifting each other. What's next? So one big way to take action is petitions. And I'm sure many of you have signed or started petitions. So that's obviously a big one. I want to shout out to our young public health leaders. They are our future, our present, and they are eager and ready to be advancing health equity, racial justice, and community safety. Also would be remiss not to shout out our parents and teachers on the line. You all are doing amazing. And I see you and appreciate you. Next. One minute, Amber. Great. Next are sign-on letters. Um, in particular, there have been letters that have come out of schools of medicine, nursing, and public health 
at Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, others. So that's for those who are connected to universities, a way to be connected. And I'll chat a bunch of links after I talk. Next is call in actions. This is a great way to call the people who have the power to give you what you want, which we call our targets, um, and make sure that they know what we're asking for. Next, social media advocacy. You may have seen requests to sort of hold a sign, uplifting demands. This is a great way online and COVID safe uh, to do this work. This, these images come from Doctors for Camp Closure. Thank you to them. And um, similar groups are doing similar things, demonstrating our health voice online. Next. Meetings with targets. I actually have had so much more success actually getting meetings with the people who have the power to give you what you want than previously. And you can do these over Zoom. This is a district attorney here that we've been having regular meetings with. So I encourage you to do that as part of an inside outside strategy. Next. Many of you have probably seen car actions happening. I want to shout out Brooke Anderson, the brilliant photographer on this, who actually wrote a post recently about how everyone can be taking really good car action pictures, like this one of a public health worker. And I'll link that as well. Next. Another is media advocacy, and that can take the shape of a in real life press conference like this one that was hosted by the National Nurses United um, out in Chicago where they are fighting back against the jail system there, which has one of the biggest outbreaks in the country. But media advocacy can also be virtual press conferences, which we've had success with, writing press releases, giving quotes to the media, writing op-eds, letters to the editor, etc. Banner drops and in strategic places where you know you'll get a lot of attention. And I should say, I'm like, I'm not a lawyer, and there are a lot of great Know Your Rights resources from the National Lawyers Guild, Vision Change Win, ICNL, and CSL, other orgs, and I will link those as well. Next. Projections. Um, this is great. It does require particular equipment, so, you know, that might not be accessible to everyone, but if it is, it's another great way to get attention and it can be used for the media. This was featured in local media. Next. Last, I just wanted to highlight that there are other creative in-person actions that people can take that are COVID safe. Now, this picture admittedly is not health workers, the others were. This is Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity demanding that Governor Newsom release everyone in ICE custody, but I just wanted to get our creative juices flowing a little. So, next. So please, you can join us in this work to advance health equity, racial justice, and community safety. This picture was long before COVID-19, just so people don't feel worried, but demonstrates the power of combining different health sectors in this work. Next. Next slide. So this is just, you can take maybe a screenshot of this, whoops. There you go. Uh, maybe a screenshot of this so you can see the different ways for us to be connected through different channels. You can join Public Health Awaken, which is our national network of health workers taking action together for social justice. Our website has recently released resources, including public health messaging toolkits about not policing the pandemic and about um, decarceration, reentry, and all those sorts of things. So please connect with us, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks so much, Amber. So we've got a bunch of questions that are coming through our Q&A and please continue to, um, to write in your questions. So we'll get right to it since we have a few minutes left and I'm gonna pose this question to sort of to the entire group of panelists. So the first question coming through is, what are your thoughts on testing all staff and incarcerated people as a matter of public health? Yeah, so I'd, I'd love to um, chime in here. I've been thinking a lot about testing. We've also been tracking testing numbers um, across the country and also in North Carolina. So I think um, staff have in general been asked to get um, their test at community clinics rather than be testing tested by correctional um, employers. And I think there are big problems with this. The states have been using HIPAA as a, a way to sort of shield themselves around like not doing it. Um, but I think that 
um, Tennessee and some other places have started to say that they're going to test all staff. And I think that is so important um, because I think staff are the ones who are moving in and out of um, uh, prisons and jails and back into the communities. So they're the ones that are bringing it in and also bringing it outside. And so they're the pathway to transmission. So it's really important to know um, if they um, have it or not. And I think that correctional entities have to be forward thinking and proactive. They also need to protect their staff. Um, staff who work in correctional facilities have not been prioritized for testing the way that other first responders have. So police and fire um, get prioritized for testing. They can get tests very quickly, rapid access. Um, correctional uh, officers and other people that work in prisons have not. And that's a big problem. And so we have some policy work that we need to do, but we also need correctional entities to really um, to step up and protect their staff and the community and the people who are incarcerated. Thanks, Lauren. Anybody else? Okay. So we'll move to the next question. So this, I think maybe Amber, you can um, jump in on this. How do we sustain the momentum and pressure um, of releasing people post COVID to make sure that we can continue on this um, path for decarceration? Yeah. Yeah, I think for that one, this is this points to the importance of getting plugged into and bolstering any existing community organizing, coalition building, movement infrastructure. Um, and a lot of that work is very hyper local. And so, you know, different people, like if, if anyone wants to reach out and like, hey, I live in this place, who should I be talking to? Um, I welcome those kinds of emails. I would love to get folks connected to the partners I have on the ground in different places and or to help you some, do some research about where, where those sort of efforts already exist. But this infrastructure exists and we need to be plugging into that um, now and beyond and uplifting the, you know, I am thinking about even our, one of our sheriff's deputies here in Alameda County, uh, Sergeant Ray Cowley, he said something in the media, like, you know, people might be asking if we were able to release people during COVID, why couldn't we long term? And I think they might have some validity to that. And so I think the officials know that this is coming and we really need to apply adequate pressure to make sure that's a reality. Great. So kind of along those same lines, do you think that COVID-19 has changed the landscape for campaigns and movements to end mass incarceration? And maybe Bernadette, we can start with you and anybody else want to chime in? I think the opportunity exists, but what concerns me is that we as human beings tend to have a very short memory. So oftentimes when the crisis is over, then we go back to doing business as usual. And that's my greatest concern. I think um, you, I think you've mentioned Dana earlier, bail reform and lots of bail reform efforts going on throughout the country. And New York last year passed a law for comprehensive bail reform. And everybody was excited when I was last living in New York City. I worked on that as part of my um, lobbying efforts. And then, you know, a few couple of months ago, Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature completely turned back many of those reforms. So while Governor Cuomo gets a lot of attention and praise for how he's handling COVID-19, nobody was really paying attention to the rollback of bail reform that was happening at the same time all this other attention was happening. So that's what really concerns me. Amber, any thoughts on this? Or Lauren? So could you repeat the question? So it's really how has COVID-19 changed the landscape for thinking about mass incarceration and ending or movements to end mass incarceration sort of related to the previous question? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's changed the organizing conditions. I think people are more plugged in. We saw a similar thing after the 2016 election. People got really alarmed and suddenly wanted to get involved in campaigns if they hadn't been already, which is great. So I think we have actually more energy and attention on this, which is powerful. Um, I also think that 
you know, we can point to like in our local context here, we've decarcerated, we've released a lot of people and we simultaneously have seen crime go down. And so for those of us who have known, think, thinking about to the, the piece you were lifting up earlier, Lauren, about like, there's actually not a tension between public health and public safety. These are mutual goals that we can advance together. I think we're going to be able to point to that kind of data after. And I think it's we've pushed for bolder things in this and it's actually going to set a precedent for us to be really pushing for transformative change instead of just nibbling at the edges of reform. Great, thanks. So this is more of a, a data question. Um, at present, good data matters more than ever. So what data sources can be leveraged in service to the health and experiences of incarcerated populations? And what political social actions can we take to call for depopulating prisons, jails immediately and long term? So I think we've kind of answered the second question. So Lauren, you, you want to take the lead on this first question around the importance of having good data. Sure. So I totally agree. And I think that data in many ways has been hard to come by. And um, there's also a question in there around media pressure. And so maybe I can touch on that as a way to have more data transparency and how we've been successful in that. Um, so about six weeks ago, our team decided like to start looking at North Carolina and figuring out what was going on. And they had just posted a table um, of number of people tested and number of cases people who are incarcerated, they still don't report any staff data. Um, and we started tracking that daily. And so we've been, we grew from there. We've been tracking that data since um, the sometime in March. And um, we've been looking now on the web and pulling down daily numbers for all the states that are reporting. 49 states currently are reporting prison um, incidents and um, at all kinds of different data differently defined. And we're creating a data dictionary to help us understand what those numbers mean. Um, so we've been looking at that longitudinally and we've also been compiling it. You can go to covidprisonproject.com to look at those numbers. Um, and there are other groups that are doing the same thing, um, but defining it differently. And so um, take a look at what we're doing and then we link to the other places that are also trying to track the data. We've also started pulling down policies and looking at timelines of when different policies were enacted. So like when visitation was cut off, when the staff had access to masks, when um, medical copays were suspended, who's doing that, um, and when they implemented it to try to understand what impact that might have on um, prevalence over time and um, also coding the different states to see who's doing the worst and who's doing the best as far as policy enactment. Um, and we, you know, so we've been looking at these data and we know which states don't have data out yet. And so I've been making my rounds on um, local media, just calling out states that have not been posting data yet. And it's worked. So we did that in Kentucky. Um, I was on the nightly news, strangely, in Louisville. And they, um, the next day, Kentucky posted their numbers. And so I think just saying, look, everybody else is doing this and you're not doing it make systems really nervous. Um, and I think that we need to continue to push in that way because some people have started to put data out, but the data is not very good or they're removing recovered cases from their um, totals. And so I think we all just need to say, this is an, it's an absolute necessity to understand what's happening in these facilities. We need to be collecting it. We need to be calling people out um, when their data is not very good or when it's absent. And then the Vera Institute of Justice has also been tracking um, jail release data. So they've been showing for all the big jail systems um, how many people have been released. And they've also been modeling to figure out who, how many more people need to be released. Um, and so they've got really good data you can go to as well. Great. And I have a follow up question about that, because there's been a lot of conversation around the importance of disaggregating the data by race, knowing who's been incarcerated, who is incarcerated and knowing that communities of color, both outside and inside are, are really bearing the brunt of this disease from both mortality and morbidity perspective. Can, do, can you add some thoughts on the data? Because if you're seeing data, but it's not telling us who's being infected, then it's not as helpful as it needs to be. No, I absolutely agree. And so the data that we're seeing is actually really um, bare bones. Some states are doing better and some states are doing like just number of people. And it's on a press release at, in a PDF that came out in like April 17th. One state is reporting um, race data and it's the state of Tennessee. So they have their data and then they have a little, but they're not breaking it out there in the ways that we would want them to, right? So they're not breaking it out with demographic characteristics by number of people tested, number of people positive, number, et cetera. They're just, they just have like a little supplemental box that says like number of confirmed cases among 
and then they have race categories. Um, that just appeared last week. So they're doing something, it's not good enough. They're the only state that's doing it. We also need to know that as far as who's being released, right? Because we, we suspect that there are also disparities there. So who are the people that are being released? What, what do they look like? Who's not being released? And that's something that we absolutely don't know enough about either. Dana, can I quickly add some- Go ahead. I just wanna say data are not enough. You know, and I think we, we do this a lot. We want to fall back on data. And you know, I do these trainings all over the country. And I can tell you, ex especially in confinement, you know, you, we, we may sometimes forget we're dealing with human beings and throwing numbers at people. It actually oftentimes can come off as elitist. And so you have to actually do the work to build these relationships. When I talk about housing for transgender people, in particular trans women in this country, Data is not, you know, there's, we have plenty of data. The Bureau of Justice Statistics at the DOJ has data. And, you know, we have a lot of trans people who are formerly incarcerated, who are starting their own organizations, doing advocacy. Um, Zahara Green in Atlanta, Georgia has an organization and she's amazing and she goes all over the country and talks about this, her experience as a black trans woman having been incarcerated. And those types of things are incredibly impactful. Human beings are not really going to always be moved by numbers and charts. They're gonna be moved by the people who are sitting in front of them. And that's what gets people to change their behaviors. Thank you for that. I completely, completely. I, I agree. Thank you so much, Bernadette. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, I wanna give you all the opportunity to just offer some closing points that maybe our audience can take away, um, calls to action that you may have, things that we need to continue to consider as we work through this challenging pandemic. Bernadette, I'm going to start with you. I, I just really hope that we don't, we, we do a good job in making some reforms now, but that we don't backtrack. That is the most important thing. And I think oversight is important, but working with corrections officers is incredibly important. I think a lot of the problems with implementation and enforcement of certain laws is because police officers, correction officers, youth institution officers have actually been left out of the process. And I can't emphasize enough working with the unions of those professionals to get things done and figure out how we can collaborate together and move forward. Great. Thank you. The, the sort of the power of collaboration and working with all of the stakeholders is really going to be necessary. We have to do this together. Lauren, any um, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I just think that thank you so much for putting this together. And, I, and this is unique from anything else that I've heard, you know, this real focus on policy and thinking about um, what what is happening now and how to sustain and um, you know, engage in progress in the future. And I think that's such a big part of it. You know, this is what's happening now has made people pay attention who maybe haven't paid attention in the past, but what's happening um, in the criminal legal system is not different than what has been happening, um, you know, over time. And, and so we, we've known it, we've ignored it. This has amplified it. Um, and I think in some ways there have been some doors that have opened, but they cannot shut. Um, you know, after we, we get through this pandemic. Great, thank you. And Amber. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, one of my closing thoughts I'm left with, maybe just coming off the heels of this data conversation, is how complicated the situation is. I'm, I'm thinking of the multiple ICE detention centers where people were pepper sprayed because they did not want to get tested because they knew if they got tested, that they would put, be put in solitary confinement. And solitary confinement is not an acceptable form of quarantining. It is not a form of quarantining. We actually know that solitary confinement increases the risk of death and increases different health harms. So I think I totally feel like we can't just take data on face value. And that's why for me, I think we really need to be pushing for folks to get released. The virus does not differentiate between someone who is sentenced or pretrial or has different types of charges or convictions. And we actually need to be leading with science to make sure that those who are high, at highest risk of COVID-19 or those who are primary caregivers for loved ones, that they get out and are able to protect themselves and their loved ones. 
Great. Thank you so much. Colleen, I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay, thanks, Dana and Lauren and Bernadette and Amber. Thank you so much for spending this past hour with us and sharing your time and expertise and responding to questions. We really appreciate it. Um, I just want to let all the panelists know that the recorded webinar with transcription will be available on our website in the next few days. I apologize to those of you who tried to get on the Facebook Live at the beginning. We had a little problem there, but we were able to make it on, but you can view the entire um, webcast uh, in a few days on our website. Please mark your calendars for the next webinar in our Emergency Preparedness Ethics and Equity series entitled Scholarship Through Adversity, First Generation Student Experiences, Challenges, and Insights During COVID-19. That information is on your screen now. The webinar will be on Monday, May 18th at 2 p.m. Online registration is available. Our moderator will be Dr. Yesenia Marino, Director of Inclusive Excellence Education and Training here at Gillings. And our panelists will be Stephanie Baca Atlas, a UNC doctoral student, Maria Dakima Erb with the UNC Graduate School, and Donna Jones, Assistant Dean of Students at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you all. Be well and stay safe.